Hello, and welcome to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. My name is Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com, and this week I will be taking you on a journey to continue our discovery of Anne of Cleves. Before I get started talking about Anne of Cleves, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. First, I'd like to thank all of my Patreon supporters. You have definitely encouraged me to keep doing these podcasts. This wasn't something that I had ever planned to do, and now it's become a fun part of my week. Since last week's podcast, I'm excited to announce that I've picked up two new patrons, Alithia and Catherine. Thank you so much. I want to extend another thank you to those who have been with me from the beginning, those who came in somewhere in the middle, and to the newest listeners, welcome. Don't feel you have to, but if you'd like to support me and make a monthly donation, go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click become a patron. You can choose the monthly level that fits your budget. For as little as a dollar per month, you can join my inner circle of best friends. My second announcement is that I'm using a whole new setup for my podcast. I have a brand new microphone and a mixer to help make me sound better. I hope you notice. Now let's carry on with the story of Anne of Cleves. At the end of our last podcast, we had covered Anne's lineage, her education, and the negotiations for her marriage with Henry VIII. We also covered the wedding, as well as the wedding night, and how Henry VIII was unhappy with their union. He had claimed he could not consummate the marriage, but felt he definitely could perform the task with other women. And then there was Anne of Cleves, who was still completely unaware of the gravity of the situation, but hopeful all would work out in her favor in the end. In the days following their wedding, Henry visited Anne's dimly lit bedchamber every other night in anticipation of consummating their marriage. Unfortunately, or fortunately for Anne, he still could not. At this point, Anne appears to have been slightly more aware of the trouble in her future if their marriage was not consummated. She understood that she had to do something to entice her husband, or that she may end up like two of her predecessors. Henry, on the other hand, understood that the political situation in Europe meant that he had to try his best to make this marriage work. Feeling desperate to please her husband, Anne decided to write letters to Thomas Cromwell to speak with him about what was going on in her marriage. Cromwell was already in hot water with the king for arranging this marriage and feared speaking with Anne would only make him look worse in the king's eyes. So instead of speaking with Anne as she had requested, Cromwell, in all his political astuteness, decided to inform the king of Anne's letters to him instead. The last thing Thomas Cromwell wanted was for the king to see him favoring Anne of Cleves. He was, after all, the one being held at fault for this disastrous union. When Cromwell eventually told Henry, he was told that he should communicate with Anne the lack of feelings the king had for her. So, Henry wanted to make Cromwell his scapegoat, and Cromwell wouldn't have any part of it. Instead, he spoke to Anne's Lord Chamberlain, the Earl of Rutland, and advised him to find a way to change Anne's behavior with the king. Good grief, if one of them had just had the balls to give Anne some advice on how to entice the king, things may have turned out differently, but no, nobody did. Not long after the marriage of Henry and his new queen, a joust was held in Anne's honor at Greenwich. This time, Anne had the forethought to dress in a manner that was more appealing to her husband. Instead of dressing in the German fashion she had been accustomed to, Anne dressed in the English fashion. She even wore a French hood. Anne was making every effort to win over Henry. Edward Hall commented in his chronicle how everyone had noticed her beauty more in this new attire. Everyone except the king, that is. This did nothing to change his mind about Anne. He was still unhappy. At this point, it wasn't only in the bedchamber that the king and queen did not get along. It was reported that the king and queen had a disagreement over the Lady Mary. What was said is uncertain, but Anne, feeling frustrated with all the work she was doing to attract the king, began to assert herself more to gain some control in this horrible situation she was in. This type of behavior on Anne's part did not help her cause. The last thing she should have been doing was upsetting the king, who already did not like her. After their first few weeks of marriage, on the 4th of February, 1540, the couple moved by barge from Greenwich to Westminster. This was a grand affair where the king would show off his new bride in all their glory. 
As the barges passed the Tower of London, the cannons fired a thousand times to acknowledge the presence of the king and queen. It is telling at this point that the couple's marriage would never recover from its rocky start because Anne and Henry traveled in separate barges and not together as had been done with her predecessors. The normal celebration procession of the king and his new queen through London to Westminster was also missing, but this didn't seem all that strange since Anne had not received a coronation or had one scheduled on her behalf. The trip to Westminster, I believe, is the point that Anne finally realized, after hearing the whispers of her household, that things were worse than the non-consummation of their marriage. Henry, it appears, made it obvious now that he would not give Anne all that was befitting of the new queen. Now, not having a coronation might not have been such a big deal to Anne since her predecessor Jane Seymour was not crowned, but that was delayed due to religious uprisings in England, not because the king did not like her. It was after the events of the 4th of February that Anne decided to put her all into the role as queen consort, since her role as wife was not what she had expected it to be. At Westminster, Anne acquainted herself with her new household, which totaled 126 in all, roughly the same amount as Catherine of Aragon had when she became queen in 1509. There were a fair amount of ladies who came with Anne from Cleves, and also all the English ladies who had jockeyed for positions in the Queen's household once they had heard about the marriage treaty. Being in the Queen's household was a privilege and an honor given to the most beautiful ladies of notable families. Sometimes even the King would choose which ladies would attend to the Queen. Unfortunately for Anne, there was a young lady in her household that was placed there by the King. Catherine Howard had been spotted by Henry at a banquet held by the Bishop of Winchester, most definitely, the king was attracted to Catherine's beauty and youthfulness, and of course, he believed she was a virgin, unlike his current wife. Anne of Cleves was fully aware of the attraction her husband had for young Catherine, but we'll get back to that later. Henry and Anne continued their charade for the first few months of their marriage, with only the king's closest advisors knowing his true intentions. Thomas Cromwell had been Henry VIII's closest advisor since the downfall and death of his predecessor, Cardinal Wolsey. Cromwell had the king's ear in all matters and pretty much was running the country for him. When the Cleves' marriage backfired, Cromwell was rightfully concerned about his position with the king. However, in April 1540, Henry raised Cromwell to the Earldom of Essex. He also created him Lord Great Chamberlain. From an outsider's perspective, this looked as though Cromwell was safe from the wrath of the king. On that very day, a bill was also passed through Parliament confirming Anne's dower. As always with Henry VIII, those two events occurred as a means to throw off what was actually going on. There were more sinister plots happening behind the scenes. A plan was already in motion because Henry wanted out of his marriage with Anne so that he could be with Catherine Howard. And if Cromwell could not do it, then he would find someone who could. But in the meantime, he'd make Cromwell believe he was still his closest advisor. This is how Henry VIII worked. Now, when it comes to Anne's dower, Henry knew that he had to keep up pretenses because her brother, the Duke of Cleves, was paying attention to what was going on in England. One wrong move and England could lose Cleves as an ally, which would mean that they would no longer have support against France and the Empire. At the beginning of the summer of 1540, Catherine Howard's star was beginning to shine, while things began to look a bit bleaker for Anne. Anne was very observant, and she was aware of the way that Henry behaved around the young lady in her household. Anne may have had concerns that she would end up just like Catherine of Aragon or Anne Boleyn if she did not go along with what the king wanted. It was also around this time that rumors had started to float around about Henry and Catherine, that quote, citizens of London saw the king very frequently in the daytime and sometimes at midnight pass over to her on the River Thames in a little boat, end quote. The citizens saw this as the king having one of his affairs that he was known for, and not discarding Anne for a new bride. During the May Day celebrations, there were several days of spectacular jousting events, and Anne appeared in her queenly duty alongside the king. Growing up in Cleves, Anne lived a very sheltered life. Her time as queen offered her many amazing opportunities, and she relished in her royal position. Unknowingly, this event would be Anne's last public appearance as queen. 
Anne's popularity only continued to grow the longer she was in her role as queen. She continued to learn English, and the king's subjects enjoyed her modesty. There were many English subjects who were fond of Anne because they believed she was a reformist. But in all actuality, Anne was Catholic, and remained Catholic until her final breath. Cromwell's favor may have already began to turn, but it was definitely for the worst when Henry VIII started questioning him about all the religious disputes going on in London. This was nothing new, but suddenly Henry was acutely aware of them and was looking for someone to blame. Since Cromwell was instrumental in the dissolution of the monasteries, the king knew exactly who to blame. Cromwell's continued favor was tied in whether or not he could get Henry the divorce he wanted. On the 6th or 7th of June, one of the king's secretaries, a man by the name of Thomas Risley, showed up at Cromwell's house in London. When Cromwell saw him, he asked, have we any news? Risley said that he did not, and then asked Cromwell if he had any business for him to carry out, at which Cromwell then replied, no, I have no business now, but one thing is stuck in my head which troubles me and I thought to tell you. The king said he does not like the queen. He has not liked her from the beginning. I believe she is still as much a maid as when she came to England. Risley was surprised by Cromwell's statement, but had no words of advice for him and reportedly left. It was only a few days after that conversation that the end of favor came for Cromwell. He was arrested on the 10th of June, 1540. The scene played out as Cromwell was leaving the Parliament building to head to dinner. A sudden gust of wind blew his hat from his head and it fell to the ground. Normally when a gentleman lost his hat, it was customary for everyone to remove their hats as a sign of respect. When Cromwell bent down to pick up his hat, no man showed him the respect that was warranted. At which Cromwell replied dryly, A high wind indeed must it have been to blow my bonnet off and keep all yours on. The men around him pretended not to hear what he had said and carried on to dinner. During dinner, no man spoke to Thomas Cromwell. Once dinner was over, all the lords proceeded to the council chamber where they would carry out their daily business. When Cromwell finally reached the chamber, all the men were already seated, at which he said, quote, you were in a great hurry, gentlemen, to get seated, end quote. Once again, his words were ignored. And as he went on to sit in his chair, Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, yelled out, Cromwell, do not sit there. That is no place for thee. Traitors do not sit amongst gentlemen. At this point, Cromwell was furious with the treatment and said, I'm not a traitor. And as he spoke those words, the captain of the guard entered the chamber and arrested him. The arrest of Thomas Cromwell was a shock to many. He had been the king's closest advisor for many years. Even Thomas Cromner was surprised, saying, I loved him as my friend, for so I took him to be. But Cromner understood that his dear friend had been branded a traitor, and so he must now cover his own tale, and then followed that by saying, Now if he be a traitor, I am sorry that ever I loved him or trusted him. How hard it must have been for people of the Tudor court to one day have a great friend whom you trusted, and the next you must behave as though they were the scum of the earth. Unfortunately for Cromwell, his downfall was greeted with much happiness all over England, for there were those who believed the absence of Rome in their life and the dissolution of the monasteries were solely his fault. They felt he finally got what was coming to him. A couple of weeks after their arrest of Cromwell, Bishop Stephen Gardner, another close advisor to the king, wrote a memorandum detailing how Henry VIII wished to proceed with the matter regarding his marriage to Anne. The king wished to secretly investigate the marriage further. Henry also wished to look into Anne's betrothal to Francis of Lorraine. Then on the 24th day of June, 1540, Henry VIII requested Anne of Cleves move to Richmond Palace to avoid the plague. He suggested that the location would be beneficial for her health with the fresh air and sunshine. On the following day at Richmond Palace, King Henry VIII's commissioners Thomas Audley, Lord Chancellor, and Bishop Stephen Gardner visited Anne to get her to confess that her marriage with the king had not been consummated. Anne was visibly upset by this request and would not consent. Unfortunately for Anne, Audley and Gardner were able to get statements from three of her ladies on the matter. These statements may or may not be true, but they will go down in history as making Anne look completely naive as to what constitutes consummation. 
the ladies claimed that Anne believed a kiss goodnight was enough. In the early hours of the 6th of July, 1540, the king sent a messenger to inform Anne of his concerns about their marriage. Anne must have been terrified of what was about to happen. Luckily enough, Henry wished to acquire Anne's consent to investigate their marriage. Shocked and speechless by the news, Anne summoned her brother's ambassador and the two sat for a while digesting the news that she had just been given. When it all sank in, she eventually agreed. Anne was still hopeful that her marriage would be found valid. The following day, after they were summoned to Westminster, the convocations of York and Canterbury, among other leading clergy, declared the marriage null and void after hearing Gardiner speak against the validity of the king's marriage. That very day, a group of men appointed by the king went to Anne to inform her that her marriage was no more and that henceforth she would be called the king's sister. Anne held her composure the best that she could while the men were there and agreed to accept the king's wishes. It was reported later that when the men first arrived at Richmond to speak with her that Anne fainted briefly, obviously concerned over her own fate. Her brother's ambassador, Harst, had arrived ahead of the men and told Anne to have patience. Harst also reported that after she was informed that she could no longer claim the title of queen, that she cried and screamed about the news. Her heart was broken that the king would discard her so quickly. Anne had most definitely not expected the investigation to conclude so quickly and was most likely saddened by the fact that her marriage was over. She would have been relieved to not have the same fate as Catherine of Aragon or Anne Boleyn, but also saddened by the fact that her marriage fell apart, the marriage she had tried so hard to keep. Before they left, the king's commissioners requested Anne write the king a letter agreeing to his terms. She agreed, accepting the outcome of the marriage. She signed it, Anne, the daughter of Cleves. As sister of the king, Anne received many gifts. The day after Henry received her letter of submission, he wrote her back and had Suffolk, Southampton, and Risley deliver a letter to her. When the men arrived, they gave it to her with a token of money. She asked them to read it to her. They declined and asked her to have her interpreter read it to her. This was a diplomatic reaction, of course, for fear that Anne could claim that they misled her. In the letter, Henry offered to officially adopt Anne as his sister, to give her precedence over all other ladies at court except for any subsequent wife and his daughters. He also offered her a very generous annual income, two palaces, and that she would receive hangings, plates, furniture, and many jewels, and as well, a household made up of a good number of officers. While Anne appeared to play along with Henry's rules to their new agreement, she drew the line at informing her brother of the situation by letter. That was just too humiliating for her. Henry wished for Anne to inform her brother of the divorce agreement and how well she was being treated by the king and his council. Instead, Anne said that she would rather respond to a letter that her brother would send her instead of writing an unsolicited letter. The humiliation was, in her mind, too great to do so. Unfortunately, Anne would not have a say in this matter either. Henry insisted that she write the Duke of Cleves. He worried that if she did not, that it would appear that Henry was breaking his former agreement with the Duke. Anne wrote her brother the letter which explained that she was no longer the Queen. She ended her letter saying, quote, I propose to lead my life in the realm, end quote. Anne was fully aware at this point that Henry would hold her as a hostage in England to keep friendly terms with her brother and John Frederick. Remember John Frederick from the last podcast? He was Anne's brother-in-law and heir to Cleves if her brother died without any sons. Later that day, Anne sent her wedding ring back to Henry and requested that it be broken into pieces because it no longer had value to her. So there we have it. Anne's marriage to Henry VIII was now declared null and void and she would henceforth be called the king's sister and would lead her life in England. In part three of this series, we'll cover Anne's time after the end of her marriage to Henry VIII and carry through until her death in 1557. Thank you so much for joining me today for this Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Until next time.